Hey, Tim Storm here from Storm Writing School with another writing craft term for you today, this time falling action. I'm the only guy on the internet who understands what falling action is. Just kidding. But I am demonstrating hubris, which, if I were a hero in a tragic play, might bring about my downfall, and that's what falling action is. In the late 1800s, Gustav Freytag published his Technique of the Drama, which posited a five-part structure for drama. He was looking at plays, ancient Greek, Shakespearean, and modern German mostly, modern for him, and he called uh, the fourth part of his pyramid the return or fall. It's really just more of a triangle than a pyramid. I'm not sure quite how it got that name, but this part of the drama is spurred by what he called a tragic force that creates a downward movement for the hero of the story. The examples Freytag uses are from Romeo and Juliet, King Lear, Macbeth, Othello, and Coriolanus. Keep this in mind because he's mostly talking about tragedy and what happens in many tragedies is that about halfway through the play or story there's a turn of events which leads to a reversal of the hero's good fortune up to that point. Here's a quote straight from Freytag. When at a certain point in the action, there enters suddenly, unexpectedly, in contrast with what has preceded, something sad, somber, frightful, that we yet immediately feel has developed from the original course of events and is perfectly intelligible from the presuppositions of the play, this new element is a tragic force or motive. Translation, at some point in the story, there's something called a tragic force, which is a sad, somber, or frightful event that arises through a cause-effect chain, but is in contrast with the mostly happy stuff that precedes the tragic force. And Freytag's example is when Romeo has married Juliet, he is placed under the necessity of killing her cousin Tybalt in the duel and is banished. That tragic force brings about the falling action that leads to the climactic catastrophe of the story, which happens when the two star-crossed lovers end up killing themselves. Spoiler alert. That tragic force, by the way, occurs in Act 3, Scene 1, which is the 12th scene of the play, and guess how many scenes there are total? 24. You can actually read Freytag's technique of the drama for free online because it's well past its copyright limits, but if you read it, you will see that falling action is not the resolution of the story as is often portrayed in uh, kind of high school diagrams that you see in English classes. It is not what comes after what we today would call the climax. It is what precedes our climax, which in Freytag's parlance is called the catastrophe. He is very clear about this and he gives loads of examples. The problem is he calls the midpoint of the play the climax and that is completely thrown off sort of these modern generations of high school teachers who sometimes teach Freytag's Pyramid as the quintessential structure for drama, which it kind of is. But it gets changed from this to this. Falling action is simply the movement of the character from the story's midpoint to another point in the story, which is often referred to as the all is lost moment, which is usually right before the climax. It's falling action because the character's fortune follows a general downward trajectory. Now, one could argue that even non-tragedies have this falling action insofar as the story after the midpoint generally does get more challenging for the protagonist. The conflict is more dangerous, the stakes are higher, the urgency of the objective is stronger. From the perspective of the story's events or plot, a visual representation that might seem to be rising. More conflict, higher stakes, more urgency. But from the perspective of the character, fortunes are falling. For more on Freytag's Pyramid, check out my article uh, from my blog, link in the description below. And thanks for watching.